Can you hear me okay back there? I guess we've had a, this looks like it was set up for Tom Woods or, 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 or Anthony Fauci, like that. And the, the, the topic that uh, Jeff assigned me, a strategy against woke, well, it turns out that Hayek and Mises had this uh, strategy worked out many years ago, 60 and 70 years ago. I'm gonna start with a couple of quotes from uh, Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises on the topic. And, uh, and then I'm gonna explain about how some of my own research uh, fits in here. And I think it is a strategy, an academic strategy that we need to use to, uh, to fight the, uh, you know, the totalitarians in our midst, as Hayek called them. And the first little quote I wanna read you is from The Road to Serfdom, the famous Road to Serfdom, 1944. There's a chapter called The End of Truth. And if you wanna know what's going on in American society today, read that chapter. And here's something that Hayek said. He said, that in the disciplines dealing directly with human affairs and therefore most immediately affecting political views, such as history, law, or economics, okay, the disinterested search for truth cannot be allowed in a totalitarian system. And the vindication of the official views becomes the sole object, is easily seen. These disciplines have indeed, in all totalitarian countries, become the most fertile factories of the official myths, which the rulers use to guide the minds and wills of their subjects, official myths. Now I've been at this a long time, and uh, one of my books that I co-authored in 1992 was called Official Lies, How Washington Misleads Us. And this was, this, I wrote this before I, I ran across this Hayek statement. So uh, yeah, great minds think alike, I guess. So that's my, my official lies uh, prop. Uh, another thing that he said, this is Hayek again in the, in the same chapter at Rhodes Circle, the whole apparatus for spreading knowledge, the schools, the press, the radio, and motion pictures will be used exclusively to spread those views which will strengthen the belief in the rightness of decisions taken by the authority and all information that might cause doubt or hesitation will be withheld. And in my notes here, I wrote like ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and so forth. And this was 1944, he's writing this. You know, in Murray Rothbard's uh, essay, Anatomy of the State, uh, he wrote about how, you know, there are different methods the totalitarian states can use to crush dissent and mass murder uh, a Soviet style is a little risky because the people might not like that. They might fight back. So propaganda uh, and brainwashing can be an effective, cheaper tool for, uh, for, to get the, the public to, to submit. And that is certainly in keeping with what Hayek was saying uh, here. Now, Mises himself addresses the same topic in his book, Theory and History, first published in uh, 1957. And he said this, to lie about historical facts and to destroy evidence, I have Hillary Clinton let me written in there, and to, to destroy evidence has been in the opinion of statesmen, diplomats, politicians, and writers, a legitimate part of the conduct of public affairs and of writing history. And then he says, one of the main problems of historical research is to unmask such falsehoods. So, and of course, that's sort of what I've been up to for, uh, for quite a while also. That's why my other book is called Lincoln Unmasked, my second uh, 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 book, un Unmasking Falsehoods. And so, th so these are the enemies we're talking about. And one more quote from Mises. He says, many historians are misled by spurious social and economic doctrines, a part of the last 80 years contributions to economic and social history is almost useless on account of the writer's insufficient grasp of economics. And there's where the Austrian school comes in. This is where uh, you know, I learned so much myself. You know, if you read Human Action, there's a lot of history in that book. You know, he had voluminous understanding. My Macy's had a voluminous understanding of world history. And the same with Murray Rothbard uh, and, uh, and, and others in, in, in that line. And so, and one of the big problems is that the history is written by historians. It's, it's not, and they, they usually know nothing at all about economics. When I stirred, first started writing about Lincoln, 
I was a Civil War buff. I was just sort of fascinated about what would motivate men to do what these men did in the, in the American Civil War. And I got to reading about Lincoln and I, under, and I found out that, that for his entire life in politics, for 25 years, it was exclusively devoted to protectionism, bringing back the Bank of the United States and cronyism and, 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 and uh, crony capitalism. He once said he wanted to be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois. DeWitt Clinton invented the spoils system in New York, the governor of New York, and, and Lincoln wanted to be the, the big political pork barrel guy of Illinois. That's what he said as a, as a young man. And then when you get the, he gets to be president, and the official story is that, well, this had nothing whatsoever to do with why he was nominated or why he became president. And that all sounded a little fishy to me, that he would spend 25 years of his life on these things, and that's, that was his only reputation uh, as a politician. And of course, that had nothing what to do with why he became president. And that's how I got into this. And so one of the first things I did is I wanted to see, well, what, are, what does the history profession say about Abe Lincoln? What are these, these are, there, what, are there official myths about that? And I found out that one of the persons that's supposed to be the expert on economics of Lincoln is a man named Gabor Borat, who was a, a director of the big Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. He's, he wins all these book awards all the time, $50,000, $35,000, I read about this. And here's what he said. He wrote uh, an essay called The Lincoln and the Economics of the American Dream. And this was all I could find of the substance of what he had to say about Lincoln and economics. Lincoln's economic policies were designed to improve everyone's standard of living. That's, that's all I could find. What were these economic policies? Protectionist tariffs. Yeah, as John C. Calhoun once said, they, they want to protect us against low prices. So that's everybody said, crony capitalism, capitalism run amok. Yeah, that, that's that a little bit everybody. Bringing back the central bank run by politicians. That is a good idea. Put all the money in charge of politicians. Put politicians in charge of all the money, okay? He also says, you know, Lincoln his whole life was an advocate of deporting all the black people out of America. It was called colonization. He was the manager of the Illinois Colonization Society. It, they used tax dollars to deport the small number of free black people out of Illinois. And uh, there's a book called Colonization After Emancipation, published about five years ago. Uh, it shows that to his dying day, he, he and uh, William Seward were counting how many ships they would need to ship all the black people out of America. And Gabor Borat uh, is honest. He says this, he said this, I'm quoting him again. Lincoln was the leading proponent of black emigration out of the United States. He calls it immigration. <laughs> This deportation back immigration. And then, but then after that, in the same book, in the same book, he gives he has a whole page of rationales for why Lincoln wanted to deport all the black people. And this is the last one that I listed in my book. And this is a direct quote from Gabor Borat in his, his book, The Lincoln Enigma, page 16. This is how honest people lie. You know, when he made speeches saying we should deport the black people, well, he, was telling, he was telling honest lies. And when my book came out, I had an email from one of Gabor Borat's faculty colleagues at Gettysburg College. He said, I couldn't believe this. I thought, you, surely this guy's lying. I can't believe my colleague because Borat apparently was, was he was you know, held up as you know, the stellar scholar at Gettysburg College. He wins all these awards. So this guy tells me, I went to the library and I picked up this book, and sure enough, there it was, page 16. This is how honest people lie. And so what I'm saying is, you know, when I quoted Mises and Hayek about uh, the role of historians and being corrupted in a totalitarian system uh, and, 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 and official lies and official myths, these are examples, is what I'm talking about. And if, you have, if you're schooled in Austrian economics, you certainly would just brush aside and, and, and you would discredit the type of things he said about Lincoln and economics, that one little quote about he, he only he, he was a good-hearted man who just wanted everyone to share in prosperity. You know, you know what, what politician could you say that about, Not, let alone Abraham Lincoln, but anybody. Then there's James McPherson, the sort of the acknowledged dean of Civil War historians. I looked up, well, what does McPherson say, if anything, about economics on this? And he says, there's one passage of one of his writings. He said, Lincoln signed an astonishing blitz of laws, most of them passed within the span of less than one year, creating a capitalist revolution <laughs> and a blueprint for modern America. 
So he called a, 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 an amazing blitz of laws and regulations, a capitalist regu re, uh, you know, revolution. So if you, if you study economics, especially Austrian economics, and you understand what, what the economic world is about, uh, you know, the average citizen would not be bowled over by this, would not be fooled by this, this sort of thing. Uh, in one of Murray Rothbard's articles, he quotes McPherson on these, this, this Murray's article called Just War, which is online. And he's quoting, um, this is classic uh, Murray Rothbard snide remark here. He said, he's quoting, now this is Mc, James McPherson of Princeton saying this, negative liberty, that's, these are McPherson's words, then in brackets, Murray wrote, he means liberty. Yeah. What was the dominant America freedom from constraints on individual rights imposed by a powerful state? Exactly true. That's the whole philosophy of a, a concept. And I want to say, with, but with and this is James McPherson. Lincoln gained an opportunity to invoke the positive liberty, and then in, in, in brackets, Murray wrote, he means tyranny of reform liberalism. So in other words, if you read Murray Rothbard, you're not gonna be fooled by the James McPherson's uh, of the world. And then there's uh, David Donald, another you know, a, a big, big, big shot from Harvard, uh, Lincoln scholar. He wrote an article uh, that was sort of a counterfactual. You know, what, had, what if Lincoln had not been elected president? What would have happened to uh, social policy, not slavery and all that stuff, but economic policy, social policy? Well, it would have been a bad thing. He said uh, it, that would have blocked the important economic and social legislation enacted by the Republicans. There most likely would not have been high tariff laws. Terrible, you know, so, okay. That protected the iron industry. There would not have been a Homestead Act. Well, the Homestead Act, we now know that at least two thirds, maybe three fourths of all the free land was given to mining corporations, forestry corporations, railroad corporations, we wouldn't have had that. We wouldn't have had that. Um, I mean, no transcontinental railroad legislation, and it's sort of the quasi-nationalization of the transcontinental railroads. We would not have had that. What a terrible thing that would be. No land-grant colleges. That's where the camel got its nose under the tent of and, and created the politically correct regime that we have now, uh, you know, government-funded uh, of education. We would not have had a Department of Agriculture, he writes. You know, and now that we have 150 years of uh, central planning by the government of agriculture that has had such, uh, made such a mess of things with its price controls and acreage allotments and so forth. And so if, if you, when I pursued this literature, you know, what are the leading lights of the history profession saying about economics and Lincoln? It's all just like Hayek and Mises said, they don't seem to have any understanding whatsoever of, uh, of economics, uh, and, 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 but yet that's what people learn about the history, the economic aspects of, of history from, from these people. And so that's why uh, what we do here, I think uh, with the, the work of the Mises Institute is, is so important. And by the way, Donald Trump's uh, first speech uh, as an economic speech that he gave was in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, because it was the home of Henry Clay, who was uh, uh, another protectionist, famous protectionist. Uh, a few more examples of how this goes. Um, I have a, a subtitle of my, uh, my notes here is Crazy Hamiltonian, Hamilton Worship. Uh, that's another, another icon. Uh, Ron Chernow is the, you know, the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of the, 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 uh, the play, and the, the Hamilton play on Broadway is supposedly based on his book, his biography of Hamilton, and he actually had a little part in it, I, I read. He calls Hamilton the prophet of the capitalist revolution in America. Hamilton was the author of what was called the American system, protectionist tariffs, crony capitalism, central banking. That's capitalism. That's, uh, when my book, Hamilton's Curse, came out, uh, my, my publicist got me on the Morning Joe television program on MSNBC, and they sat me down next to Pat Buchanan, and the first thing he says to me is, Hamilton was my hero. So I, I knew it was going to be a bad day. <laughs> and, that, and the three of them just kind of screamed at me. for, But they did put my book on the screen, and I did sell a lot of books that day from, from being on there. And then, <clears throat> and, and then Ron Chernow, Ron Chernow the, you know, uh, you know, the prophet of the capitalist revolution, David Brooks, the Wall Street Journal writer, Hamilton single-handedly created capitalism. 
Historian Stephen F. Knott credits Hamilton as the founder of the America that explored the outer reaches of space, welcomed millions of immigrants, led the effort to defeat fascism and communism, produced countless technological advances, and abolished slavery and Jim Crow. All, you know, Hamilton, all ball Hamilton. Okay. Uh, David Brooks and uh, William Crystal, when, they, when they, they created what they called national greatness conservatism in the 90s, they said they wanted to, quote, reinvigorate the nationalism of Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay and Teddy Roosevelt. That didn't really work out too well for those guys. But, but uh, so the point I'm making here is that these are the kind of people who have these big, big voices in, in American society and very influential. And but when they talk about economics, it's all BS because as Mises and Hayek said, they don't really understand it. Uh, uh, another, another kind of a ridiculous example, John Steele Gordon is a, is a very well-known uh, business historian an author, and I like some of his books, but when the, when the crash happened in 08, he blamed the whole thing, the whole crash, on what he said was, quote, the baleful influence of Thomas Jefferson, because Jefferson opposed uh, the Bank of the United States, the original Bank of the United States. He opposed it. Hamilton was for it. He had a, sort of a debate between Hamilton and Jefferson in front of George Washington over, over whether the constitutionality of the bank. And so, uh, so John Steele Gordon blamed the crash of 08, not on the Fed, which he should have, but the critics of the Fed. And then, and then other people went and did even worse. They, they blamed uh, Ron Paul. I, I have other articles. That I, I, some of my articles on LewRockwell.com, some of these New York bankers are saying, well, it's because of people like Ron Paul that, don't, that the Fed doesn't have enough power. That's, that's why we, uh, that's why we had, had the crash of 08. One more example I'll give. I don't have unlimited time here, and uh, although, like like Patrick, I'm a, you know, I, I spent 41 years as a university professor, so I'm programmed to speak for an hour and 15 minutes you, 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 usually. Um, Henry Clay. Uh, if you went to the Henry Clay Museum in uh, in Ashland, Kentucky, and you would see this book, Henry Clay, the Essential American, written by you know, two historians, you know, a man and a wife. And they say the similar things about, if you read this, read the things they say about Clay. Now, Clay was also the champion of protectionism, corporate welfare, central bank, and so forth. But, you know, hagiography uh, is one of my favorite lines. If you read through books like this, Clay, he married a woman named Lucretia Hart. And he, they write that it's a union rumored to be mercenary on his part. So, you know, the gentlemanly Harry Clay Poor, poor old plain looking Lucretia Hart. They call her, they said she was plain. So he was a mercenary. He took mercy on her and married her because she was plain. And then I read on and they describe Lucretia as plain, wealthy Lucretia Hart. <laughs> <laughs> Abe Lincoln did the same thing. He married Mary Todd, the, uh, the wealthy daughter of a Kentucky slave owning uh, family. Henry Clay uh, was the owner of a large slave plantation that grew hemp in Kentucky. That's why he wanted government subsidies for to build roads and canals to transport his hemp to market. And he owned slaves, and they, these, these authors of this book said he owned slaves and continued to buy them. And then they said, while he was not a relentless pursuer of runaway slaves, he occasionally took pains to recover them. So, so but he was not relentless about it. But then in then the next paragraph, they said he proposed strengthening the federal fugitive slave law that would get the taxpayers to run down his runaway slaves. So that's why he didn't have to be relentless. He was, he, he was in Congress and he was going to put money behind paying people, I mean, bounty hunters, to run, the, run them down so that he wouldn't have to pay to, to run away his slaves. And uh, they say he, uh, you know, he owned all these slaves. He never freed any of his slaves because he liked farming too much. <laughs> so, so, so what I'm saying is if you get into the historical literature on, uh, on these great men, uh, you know, great politicians, uh, if, you, if you look at them with an eye that is informed, a lens through which uh, you have some economic uh, training behind you and Murray Rothbard style libertarian philosophy that you're familiar with, it's pretty easy to break down what they're saying and to dispute what they're saying on these things. And as um, uh, you, you're all probably familiar with a famous saying by Lord Acton that uh, uh, power corrupts and absolute power 
uh, and, and what is it? The power corrupts, uh, yeah, crime corrupts, absolutely. The very next line is that all great men are bad men. That was, that was Lord Acton. Nobody quotes the next line. All great men are bad men. And my time is up, and that's all I'm going to say about these bad men for now. Thank <laughs> you.